Powered by the Montana Television Network. Montana This Morning continues on Montana's News Leader. Bipartisan leaders have exactly two weeks to come up with a border security deal or they risk another government shutdown. I'm Mark Liverman with more on what's getting in the way of a compromise. And we have new information about both the gunman and his captive in that hostage situation on a bus in Butte on Wednesday. Coming up, uh, police describe the dangerous situation and the man who was held at gunpoint tells his story. Good morning to you and welcome to your Friday. I'm Missy O'Malley with Chet Lehman coming right up on 630. Top story for you now. We're exactly two weeks away from the possibility of another government shutdown. President Trump says he has no problem shutting it down again. That is if a negotiated funding deal doesn't have money for his border wall, which Democrats say he isn't getting. CBS News' Mark Liverman has more. I don't expect much coming out of the committee. The committee President Trump is referring to is the bipartisan one tasked with working out a border security deal. It is just two weeks to come up with some sort of compromise to avoid another partial government shutdown. But the president says if there is no wall, there's no deal. And if they don't have a wall, I don't even want to waste my time reading what they have because it's a waste of time. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says that's not happening. There's not going to be any wall money in the, in the, in the legislation. Instead, Democrats have proposed more than $21 billion for border security and immigration enforcement. It would pay for things like more customs officers, drug detection, humanitarian aid, even fencing. Is there a place where enhanced fencing, Normandy fencing would work? Uh, let, that, let, let them have that discussion. If there's no wall, it doesn't work. She's just playing games. In a New York Times interview Thursday, the president maintained that he could still declare a national emergency to build his wall. That's something he's been considering and talking about for weeks. I would do that. I would do that. We're going to see what happens on February 15th. The declaration would likely draw immediate legal challenges from Democrats. Mark Liverman, CBS News. Now, all this comes as U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents seized more than 250 pounds of fentanyl at the Arizona border on Saturday, nearly 400 pounds of meth. Border Patrol say it's the largest fentanyl seizure in U.S. history. An extra two to 3,000 U.S. troops are expected to be sent to the U.S.-Mexico border very soon. Unbelievable. Absolutely. Wow. Matt joins us now. Not a terrible start to the day, but we do have a crazy weekend ahead of us. Uh, yeah, you know, our temperatures are going to be pretty warm today and tomorrow, and then it all changes. <laughs> we'll talk more about those temperatures this morning into the teens, 20s, 30s. One degree in West Yellowstone early this morning. I do expect these daytime highs to be around the 40 degree mark once again today. Tomorrow's going to be fabulous as well, although we are going to add wind. We'll talk more about what you can expect over the next few days, including snow chances, all coming up in just a few minutes. Thank you, Matt. 632 now on this Friday. We have an update on a story we've been covering all week. Butte police have released details about Wednesday's nine-hour standoff and hostage situation on board a bus. MTN's John Amy tells us how police were able to end the tense standoff with an armed man who claimed he had a bomb. A 52-year-old man from Spokane, Washington, remains in custody in Butte after a nine-hour-long standoff with police Wednesday, where he's accused of hijacking a bus about 12.30 in the afternoon. The suspect, armed with a handgun, held a 45-year-old Butte man hostage on the bus for about three hours before the hostage managed to escape the gunman. It made for a tense standoff. Anytime you have a guy who's got a hostage, a firearm, he says he has explosives, that's a bad situation. This was an extremely challenging situation for police because the suspect's actions and demands were extremely irrational. He had a number of grievances with uh, the society as a rule. He wanted to speak to Ryan Zinke at one time. He wanted to speak to the governor at one time. Uh, they felt that he was probably suffering some paranoia or some mental health issues. Police credit the fast actions of the bus driver, who after escaping from the bus, went around to the rear and disabled the engine so that the suspect could not drive away. He did a great job with disabling the bus and then helping us throughout the incident. So uh, he, he's certainly one of the heroes of this whole thing. By the time the standoff reached its ninth hour, police found an opportunity to try to end it, so they shot tear gas into the bus. He left the gun in the bus, and then, of course, the, the OC-10 and the uh, 
tear gas started taking effect on him and, and pushed him right out the front of the bus where he, where he was given verbal commands to take off his clothes so we could determine whether he had anything wired to him or not. Investigators found no evidence of a bomb and no injuries were reported in the incident. In Butte, John Amy, MTN News. Now, police have not released the suspect's name. They are still waiting for charges to be filed. The suspect is expected to be in court today. Now, the hostage on that bus during the standoff with police was 45-year-old Damian Baumgartner, a Butte resident. That's right. And MTN's John Amy was able to sit down with him and have a conversation about his whole ordeal. When Damian Baumgartner saw the bus driver run out of the bus after it stopped in Butte, he knew something was wrong. All of a sudden, this guy, he had a, a, some kind of a hat and a pistol inside of it, and he put it in my face and said, sit down or die. This began a three-hour-long standoff with police inside the Jefferson Lines bus. Damien, who was returning to Butte after a doctor's appointment in Missoula, thought this was the end. He told me we were both going to die today and the reason he ordered a meal was so that I could have my last meal because he already ate his. Police left food in the doorway of the bus and that's when Damien took a big chance. And I said hey just let me reach down and grab it and when I started to move forward our bodies became separated and I felt that chance and I spun around and punched him as hard as I could and ran off out of the bus and I escaped. Damien said he sympathized with his captor. He wanted a voice. He wanted to be heard. He wanted to be the white male that's homeless, that nobody gets help, that doesn't, isn't allowed to get help. He was a uh, conservative looking for a conservative place to go, which is why he chose Montana. And I told him, I said, so you chose Butte to get off in? <laughs> You went through an extremely traumatic situation. Do you harbor any ill will or anger toward your captor? I don't think he's a monster. I don't think he's a bad guy. I think that this guy was really sick. I think he was confused in his head. And unfortunately, this is the way he handled it. Damien's been homeless. He's abused drugs. And he even has a criminal record. So he says he can relate to the man who held him at gunpoint. But for now, he has a new perspective. I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful that I've had a wife. I'm grateful for even all the prison time I've done. I'm grateful for everything I've been through and I'm grateful that I'm here talking to you today. In Butte, John Amy, MTN News. Wow, simply incredible interview. If you'd like to see more of John Amy's interview with Damien, head on over to our websites. Shout wow. out to all of us here in Montana mor this morning on John Amy's coverage of that whole ordeal. Nine hours covering that and then sitting down Unreal. with a great interview with that. I suggest you go and listen to that full interview with Damien. Incredible. Uh, and what the bravery of that man to get off that bus. And, and thank you uh, for sharing your story with us. Damien, absolutely. Well. That. Wow. We're going to shift gears here just a little bit on this National Wear Red Day. The American Heart Association wants to raise awareness about cardiovascular disease in women. As Stella Escobedo reports, heart disease is the number one killer in women and disease rates in younger women are increasing. And then... Lime makes it great too. Mika Leia has always lived a healthy lifestyle. I was a cycle instructor. I was an athlete. I really didn't think it could happen to me. But eight years ago, the young mother's life quickly changed. It became harder to exercise and she had some chest pains. I found myself breathless and I couldn't catch my breath. And then I threw up. Turns out Mika, then just 33 years old, had a 98% blockage in her main artery and needed three stents. She had been experiencing symptoms for a year, but doctors blamed stress, even though she had family history of heart disease. For women less than 55 years old, there's actually been an increase in the incidence of heart disease. We're seeing risk factors like high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, increasing the risk. The American Heart Association warns that symptoms can be different for women. Instead of a typical crushing chest pain, there can be shortness of breath, jaw pain, nausea, vomiting, even back pain. 
Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum at Mount Sinai Hospital says it's critical to know your risk factors. A woman's entire life is really what increases her risk. So we can go back to pregnancy and see preeclampsia or high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, or even high sugars. Mika now, 41, has needed additional procedures and stents to keep her arteries open. She works with the American Heart Association to educate women. I think as women, we have that little voice inside of our head, but we don't listen to it. She continues to eat right, work out, and manage her stress. Stella Escobedo, CBS News, Los Angeles. Wow, now more than 400,000 women die from cardiovascular disease each year. That's more than the deaths from cancer, accidents, and diabetes in women combined. Important, wow. serious information there. Very different than the, the signals from men. Yeah, that's, like I think, said. the thing that throws people off on yeah. that. It is a, it, a lot of times the, diff, the symptom bases are completely different. So Absolutely. Wear red for women. I love that. Wear red for women. We're going to take a quick break. We come back. We're talking food, folks, and F-16s. Take a listen. Sure, Super Bowl Sunday is about the game, but it's also about the food. I'm Mola Lange in Atlanta with a look at the party scene and the tastes of Super Bowl Sunday. Good morning ahead on CBS this morning. The vast polar vortex is winding down. We'll look at the weekend warm up that will thaw some areas with as much as an 80 degree swing. And we're just days away from kicking off Super Bowl 53. CBS Sports' James Brown will preview the Patriots and Rams matchup. Plus, hear from Maroon 5 frontman Adam Levine ahead of the band's halftime performance. Also, we'll give you a high-flying view of what it takes to pull off one of the most carefully choreographed displays of patriotism at the big game. See with all that at 7.